Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of our podcast. Today, we, I'm here with Professor Ryan Callow, and we are discussing humans, robots, and vulnerability in the age of AI. So while people there are, we have today people watching live from YouTube, watching live from LinkedIn, watching live from StreamYard, uh, people uh, will, who will be listening to the recording uh, in the podcast and on YouTube afterwards. So everybody is welcome. And while uh, especially the live people are, are arriving, I'm going to introduce Professor Ryan Callow. Uh, so he is a professor in the University of Washington Law School. He's a founding co-director of the Tech Policy Lab. He's the co-founder of the University of Washington Center for in an Informed Public. He's also an internationally recognized and leading expert in his field. His research in, in law and emerging tech has been published in leading tech journals and uh, leading uh, law journals and technical publications. Uh, I'm, I'm a personal fan of Professor Ryan Callow. You're going to see in the discussion today, uh, his, his work has been influencing my master's, my PhD and my uh, newsletter also. For those who are arriving now, so we are discussing uh, online manipulation, robot law, AI, privacy, and on our online vulnerability and some of uh, Ryan Kalos amazing uh, scholarship that if you're not familiar today you're going to hear about it so welcome professor Kalo I'm so happy to have you here today and thank you for inviting me I'm really excited for this conversation my pleasure um so, and before we start with the questions and, and the discussion topics if you're not a, a subscriber yet make sure to sign up for uh, my newsletter to be informed of the next live talks and also job opportunities everything privacy tech and ai and receive the weekly analysis i think it's interesting if you're if you want to dive deeper into this topic so let's start first my my usually my first question is about yourself is about your journey i, I think uh, a lot of people's work has to do with their personal journey so I am, we are going to talk about your amazing work in, in the field of robot law. You're really one of the founders and everything manipulation in law, at least for me, you opened my, my mind for the world of online manipulation. So, and I want to hear from you. So what took you to this way? So you were, uh, you had a legal background. So what took you to the world of manipulation and then robots and then also manipulative robots? So I want to hear from you. Was there a specific aha moment that you, you realized that you wanted to focus on that? Oh, absolutely there was. It was a very specific person, a, a very special person that I met when I first moved over to Stanford University. Um, you know, years ago, I was in uh, private practice in Washington, D.C. I was a privacy attorney at Covington and Burling, and I decided that I wanted to make a transition to academia. So I went to Stanford University to be the eventually director of, of privacy and robotics there um, years ago. And I met this guy whose name is Clifford Nass. Um, and Cliff Nass, who's passed away um, er, er, early, uh, he was only in his 60s, um, is an absolute legend in human computer interaction. And along with other colleagues like Byron Reeves, um, uh, Lee Sprawl, uh, a, a bunch of other folks, um, he created this area of study called computers as social actors or you know, computers as social actors, where he showed that we are hardwired to react to anthropomorphic technology like robots and AI, if, if it's like a chatbot, uh, as though it really were a person. And study after study, experiment after experiment show the same tendency. For example, um, you're more likely to uh, be uh, uh, candid or forthcoming um, with a AI that is, that is candid and forthcoming about itself. You know what I mean? And so um, he actually advised on Clippy, the Microsoft Clippy famously, uh, and told them to make it different than what it was. And they ignored his advice. Anyway, um, I got involved with him, his lab, his students, and it opened me up to this world of goodness. If we're hardwired to react to these anthropomorphic technologies, then they also could be used to persuade us, to manipulate us just like a human being could. Uh, and perhaps even more so. And there's an area of study that, uh, which is called captology, that B.J. Fogg is associated with, F-O-G-G, -G, um, that, that dates back decades. That's precisely about the ability of, of social computers to persuade. So that's how I got into the interest in anthropomorphic manipulation and, and the like. 
So it was from the technical perspective, and then you brought the more legal. You, I, I imagine you started thinking, so how do we regulate that? So from these people are from human computer interaction. So I would say more yeah. engineering side of the, the phenomenon, right? That, that, that's right. So they're human computer interaction, human robot interaction. I'm actually going to be uh, speaking as a keynote uh, at the human robot interaction annual conference this summer, which I'm really excited about. I think it's in Colorado. Um, and uh, the other thing too, uh, Louisa, is that um, I started to read work in behavioral economics that wasn't the kind of, um, you know, optimistic, hey, nudge, let's make sure people save more, let's, let's put the vegetables, you know, at eye level for kids so that they, you know, at the, at the uh, so that they have more apples and, 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 and carrots. Um, but more the darker side of that. And so I read a pair of papers by John um, Hansen and Doug Kaiser um, that were about this phenomenon of firms, meaning companies, figuring out what people's cognitive biases are and then exploiting those cognitive biases in order to extract more social surplus from the interaction, right? Um, and so uh, my earliest work was characterized by those two things, right? On the one hand, that um, we're, we're hardwired to react to social technology as though it were real. And on the other hand, that there are incentives and examples of exploiting cognitive bias. Today, we talk about that as dark patterns, but at the time, the terminology in the 90s was uh, uh, market manipulation. That's the, the names of the papers that were that came out. Um, more recently, we work with um, Daniela DiPaolo and, and others um, at, MI, at MIT. I'm, I'm bringing those two things together, and I hope we get a chance to talk about that, like how to bring those two worlds together. But those are the two things I was really interested in. I'm, I'm grateful that you brought the topic. So digital market manipulation. I, I didn't know that dark patterns before. So this was the technical name, market manipulation. So well, this is- a... People were using different terminology. Like I should say that Harry Bringle had dark patterns already. He already talked about that for years and years and years. So uh, that it's it's not that, that market manipulation preceded it. It's just in the legal literature, when we're talking about exclu ex exploiting cognitive biases, that was known as market manipulation, but um, there was also dark patterns. That Harry was really early on that. Uh, he's got a new book about it. Uh, also, um, Greg Conti, uh, at, um, uh, who was at one of the military schools, I believe he was at, um, it wasn't Air Force. Uh, anyway, he, he, he was uh, really early and he called them malicious interfaces. You know what I mean? And so there was these different, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I, I didn't mean to, um, imply that m manipulation came before dark patterns no no so, but it's just interesting so let, let's go the second topic that i wanted to speak is about exactly what you just mentioned so, so this paper mm. which i think i read for my master's thesis digital market manipulation uh, it's from 2013 uh, for those that are listening i recommend you, you can find it on so ssrn if anyone in the audience can put in the chat so digital market manipulation from professor ryan Kello, 2013 also, there is another paper called Against Notice and Skepticism in Privacy and Elsewhere. And the third one called Nudge or Notice. So all the, those around 2012, 2013. And I read all of this. And my and, and I was writing about consent in privacy and notice. And, and when it's and I remember from the digital market manipulation, your concept of visceral notices. And that's stuck into my mind. That, that's exciting. So it's a uh, so you want to explain yourself? Uh, Ryan, you want me? So, the, okay, but go. Sure. Here. Yeah, and, and, or, or you. I mean, it's up to you. It's it's yeah, your sure. it's your show. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. It's you. You are you are the the star today. No, you you can say you you say much better than my interpretation. But just uh, to to introduce this topic of well, we are, we are going back to it. So, digital market. Th th this whole topic. Uh, so, Professor Kello, he talks about. Uh, how all sorts of manipulation that happen online. And here we are talking not much about, at least my impression when I read those papers, mostly about apps and websites, not so much about robots and bots like we talk about anthropomorphism, but more in the sense of typical, what, what we, we see as dark patterns. And if we read Professor Kello's work together with Professor Hartog and then regulating design, there's those discussions, it's really the foundation, at, at least as I see, as I teach it in my, in my courses, uh, of what we call the, the old, everything, the studies about dark patterns and, and what you were talking about, cognitive bias, the exploitation of cognitive biases. And so let's go back. So in, in this paper, Digital Market Manipula Manipulation, Professor Keller talks about visceral notices. So it would be a way to 
uh, you, we need to tell people what's going on, right? We don't want an authoritarian regime that only decides. And that's what we, we, we like the idea of notices of uh, supporting autonomy and helping people decide what they want and what they don't want. So there is this idea of visceral notices that I will, will let uh, Professor Taylor explain himself. Yeah, so you remember earlier we talked a little bit about um, about the way in which we're hardwired to react to anthropomorphic, you know, um, uh, interfaces as though a person were really there, right? Um, and there's other things about us that we we know. For for example, there are studies that show that um, people are more um, uh, lax about sharing data in an, when you have an informal like looking interface. Um, I think it was Alessandro Acquisti and his colleagues that did the Are You Bad study. But anyway, the, 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 like the, do you remember that one? So are the idea being that? like, yeah, oh, yeah. Man, so the are, idea, you, are you? Exactly. So so basically it's like what, they, what, what you see is if you have a very casual looking interface, people are, are, are more um, li likely to share more about themselves in that kind of context versus if you have something very formal looking that looks almost like a bank or, or like a government website, people are a little more standoffish. So the idea is that even as we can exploit cognitive biases to, to you know, get people to pay more for something by charging $9.99 because our brains see it as further away from 10 than it really is, for example. And just as we can nudge people to do things like by setting the default to savings, because we know people don't change defaults, so people will save more. Um, my idea was that perhaps rather than having these privacy policies that nobody ever reads and yet you're held to in these terms of service, um, rather than, than describe in general terms the practices of, of data collection and sharing and so on, that you actually convey that information viscerally, right? So the idea would be to have something anthropomorphic, like a face or eyes that, that conveyed to you, like someone's going to see this and it makes you feel that. Or making areas that are sensitive more formal in appearance as opposed to casual and making casual sensitive interfaces proper saying they're problematic. Um, another set of ideas had to do with showing people rather than telling them. So one thing that everybody's had this experience in the United States, you go to a hospital, you go to a doctor, you have to sign some HIPAA form and it tells you all your rights and everything else and no one reads them because you're sick or you just want to move on with your day. And so my idea was rather than signing some silly form, when you go into a, a medical system, they hand you a tablet and that tablet has your records and it depicts for you visually where those records are going and to whom and who's accessing them. So you literally see, you know, what is going on. Um, I remember also um, related to the concept of visceral notice. Uh, at the time, I was in conversation with their lawyers uh, in privacy was um, the gaming company. Uh, what's the, uh, I forget the name of the company right now, but they made Privacyville. The people that made like Farmville and all those other things that were so popular, you remember that gaming company? Um, they made Privacyville where you'd like go from, from <laughs> building to building. And that was the kind of example of visceral notice. So the idea was to harness what we know about people's hardwired reactions in order to convey uh, uh, privacy practices in a more salient way. And right now people like Evan Selinger, the philosopher of technology with colleagues, they're exploring um, how to do visceral notice within the context of AR, VR, augmented and virtual reality. There have been studies about the efficacy of visceral notice uh, out of the EU um, from the European Commission. Um, and so people are, 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 are experimenting with it, in part because Woodrow Hartzog has so convincingly argued that design is everything when it comes to privacy and security. Um, and uh, it's a great example that you brought about VR and, and uh, augmented reality also. And I wanted to hear from, so starting from this discussion, and let's say we'll put a date here, 2000, around 2010, 2013. So from there to here, there was a, there were many changes in privacy, right? So there were the cookie ban, at that time there were not cookie banners. So we, when we think about consent and privacy, there can be GDPR that said that consent has to be opt-in and informed. And then it's the opposite direction of visceral notices because we have longer privacy notices with, with those, those banners that nobody want, nobody goes to a website to interact with the cookie banner, but now that that's, there are many memes and jokes as the, the, the how it's the online UX uh, 
experience now, the, the, the interface experience nowadays is like a bunch of privacy pop-ups and you don't even care, you just want those pop-ups pop -up, pop out. Uh, at the same time, dark patterns became uh, legally recognized. So now we have the DSA and we have uh, in the US also laws mentioned express. So they call the C CCPA amended by the CPRA now expressly mentions. Uh, I, I have my criticism, but they say generally, OK, it's consent obtained through dark patterns it is forbidden. So we are really law. You, we see that law is really starting to get into the manipulation field. So, OK, we have this word dark patterns. It was not part of law, but now it's part of law. So I, I see positive sides. So maybe the, the, this recognition of that there may be some things called cognitive biases that can be manipulated. This was in my from my perspective, was not in the law, at least was not in privacy law. And we are bringing it to inside law that there can be those something some things called cognitive biases. But at the same time, we are still in the, the cookie banners and then there are all those tricks that I, I have a webinar with Professor Christiana Santos. She she shows how cookie banners sometimes you say I decline. And even though you say I decline in the background, there are the, the, the way the code the code is, is built, it's still be, your cookies are still being collected. So it's it's mm -hmm. uh, we are in, in, in the dark patterns in the code level. It it it, it looks like it, it looks like your, your consent was proper and there was the proper decline now, but in the background uh there are cookies being collected and, and you even and it, there needs to be an audit to realize that so you don't even have the chance to be very uh, uh paying attention and realize that because it's in the background so i want to hear from your perspective how how was this evolution from 2020 from 2012 pre-gdpr through gdpr and now are you optimistic you think things are uh, evolving in a positive direction or or no we need we need the macro changes uh, because th this autonomy is, is being suppressed and, and, and something in this sense. So I want to hear your opinion on that. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, it, it, it's the truth of the matter is, is that um, oftentimes uh, academics and to some extent industry um, uh, start to talk about something, some phenomenon um some uh condition about the world um and it takes a long time for that for the rest of of society to catch up right and so um you know the the the, the steady drumbeat of new york times and washington post articles the attention from the federal trade commission from from state regul from state regulators and state lawmakers um i think that for us the journey has not to go I won't go too too down far down this rabbit hole or, or this 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 um, history, but I think for us, um, you know, if you think about the importance of, of of the design of things like websites, you really have to go back to like Langdon Winner in like 1980. Do artifacts have politics? But that though a germinal science and technology studies paper with billions of sites, I'm exaggerating, but a lot of sites. Um, you know, we as a cyber law community, as a law and technology community, really did not pay close attention to this insight until, you know, Larry Lessig wrote Code, where he talked about code was a kind of law, an idea that he had, um, uh, that, that Joel Reidenberg actually had first in, 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 in um, Lex Informatica, but uh, to, to which um, Larry cites. Um, so that, that, that made people in my community really kind of realize what the people from STS had known all along, right? Which is that, which is that design really, really matters. So then what happens is that policymakers, people like um, Anne Kabuki, and I want to give her some credit, she didn't come up with this idea, but she she championed it in, in Canada when she was information commissioner, um, the idea of privacy by design, which focuses on the necessity of baking privacy into your design products. And it focuses on industry, right? Um, and that coupled with, you know, behavioral economics attention and nudge and all these other things, um, you know, Woody Hartsog's work, other people's work, um, uh, Lori Craner, Alessandro Quisti, many other people, uh, S Santos, or, um, and you know, eventually, policymakers started to realize, oh goodness, um, it's it, you know, design is really important, and and when you design something, it doesn't matter what you say, right? It really matters what you do and what users experience, 
And, and it took lawyers a long time to figure that out, in part because we're so word-based. You know, we do oral argument. We write briefs. You, you, you know what I mean? Like we give, deliver opinions. I mean, our world is so textual that it made all the sense in the world to us to ask, you know, oh, goodness, um, uh, what did they say? Did they do what they said? You know what I mean? Like, uh, make let's make them say something, and then they got to do what they say, and that that made a lot of sense to people. But nowadays, we we've gotten far past that. Now, not all corners of law were like that, of course. And intellectual property, patent, tr trademark, copyright, and so on. Um, obviously, there was attention to design. Uh, you, you know, a products liability paid attention to design. But those of us in the sort of law and tech policy space, you know, we were late, ironically late to the game. Now everybody's caught up. Now it would be ridiculous to pass a law that didn't talk about how privacy has to be designed into things, that didn't worry about dark patterns, other forms of manipulation, right? And that's why you see with the, with the um, newest iteration um, uh, of GDPR with the DSA, the Digital Services Act, with the, you know, the AI Act the, in Europe, they, they all now formally talk about things like design and manipulation, but it was a journey, right? Um, and, you know, forever and still to this day, uh, we have what Dan Solov refers to as privacy self-management, where on the basis of like some information and a few kind of different sources of information outside the companies themselves people are supposed to like protect themselves and police the market and that doesn't that doesn't work on this evolution i'm also is slightly positive as you say that we uh, i think the community the tech policy community has caught, caught up a bit and and law now uh I, as i mentioned before mentions dark pattern and we we have okay consent obtained through dark patterns is not allowed and the ai ai act mentions manipulation and the word vulner, vulnerability exploitation from my perspective what's still missing uh, uh, two two things are still missing first uh, if we say consent obtained through dark patterns is forbidden, is it's not enough. So what are dark patterns? So I, I think still, of course, law should not uh, regulate and put, okay, the, the, let's add a taxonomy of dark patterns here in the law. But I think designers and people, the technical people, people, the people that are developing the code, people that are designing interface, they should be more part of the discussion. Sometimes, and, and I talk a lot with uh, tech people and uh, tech uh, professionals, it's very separate. So there is the legal department and the tech department. And usually if you want the design made in a way that respects privacy, you call the legal department. So my wish, and I, I think we should advance in this sense. So those, those two disciplines, and I'd say that people that are building interfaces that code programmers, designers, uh, also marketing that will decide how the flow will be with the, with the user and the legal department, there should be more, uh, there should be a sort of merge and, and legal people should learn more about design and, and, and the law faculty, you should learn, you should hear about cognitive biases. You should hear that the, the colors, the shapes, the language you use can can push people. You're really shaping decision. And we don't. I, at least I went to law school from 2006, 2010. I didn't hear any of that. I, I went to law school in Brazil. I don't know uh, if any, other parts of the world. And at the same time, designers. I talk with a lot of designers. They don't learn about privacy in design school. They don't. They don't think that they could really, as as you mentioned, uh, Dan Solo. So they, they could really be implementing privacy through design, even if it's not written in the privacy policy. If the, if the, the legal team is not really privacy friendly. It doesn't matter if you if you build an interface that has uh, uh, that pays, pays attention to consent and to transparency and, and visual notices, and you build in a way that respects people's rights. But in order to respect people's rights, you you need to know what privacy. Is. What what are you what are fundament, the fundamental rights connected to privacy? So choice, access, all, all the stuff that we learn in law school, they should also be aware of that. And, and they have an ex immense power. People that are designing tech, they have an immense power in their hands. And I, I see a, a lot of this talking with the two, I, and I speak with legal teams and design, I see this connection. So I think a, a good way, and it's not really related to the law in itself, but maybe more of a self-regulation aspect that there could be more and more. And, and I think that, that this is my, my what, what I've, sometimes I write about that in a newsletter. Uh, and, and 
now uh, continue a little bit. Now we are moving to design and robots. So I want to add the robots and, and uh, Professor Kahlo has a, a very nice uh, cap now with the, it's from the, it's from the, the conference, right? That, you, that was- We recently. Robot, yes, exactly. This is the annual conference. Uh, gosh, it's been a dozen years now about robotics law and policy. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. It's the only one, right? Is, are there, or, or is, was the first one or is the biggest? How was it? it's, it's a major event, right? Well, I, well, first of all, I want to give credit to, to our colleagues in Europe. Uh, like I, I went to a, a robo law conference, you know, when I was just a, like a baby academic still at Stanford, you know, a long time ago called robo law in, in, in Europe. So it's not that we're the first, but we, we robot is the, the venue for robot AI and law in North America. You know, um, and people come from all over the world. They come from Haiti. They come from China. They come from all over the world. Um, and we've been around for a long time, for 12 years. Um, it was founded by myself, Michael Frunken, and Ian Kerr. Ian passed away. He was a brilliant Canadian uh, legal scholar and technologist and philosopher. Um, and now um, uh, Kate Darling who uh, runs a ethics institute in Boston um, uh, and, and, and is affiliated with MIT Media Lab is our third general chair. Um, but, you know, thanks for asking. It's like my, my favorite thing in the world. Uh, <laughs> so, and, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to bring the, the topic of Robertson. And as you said, you were an extreme pioneer and your, your paper that I found, tell me if I'm wrong, is from the first robot paper you wrote is 2010, or is there, did I miss anything before that? So I, I, I think that, yeah, I think the first thing um, I ever wrote was called Peeping Hals. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Uh, like H-A-L, uh, like Hal, you know, from, from uh -huh. Space Odyssey. Yeah. And I wrote it for this conference in Italy um, but I think, I don't know which paper you're referring to, I, I kind of forget, but I, I wrote a series then after one of about robots and privacy, which was a book chapter, one was called Open Robotics, uh, another was called Robotics and the Lessons of Cyber Law. But I, I, anyway, yes, I started writing. I have here, um, I was talking about robots and privacy 2010, robotics yeah, yeah, that, that's right. law 2014, yeah. the path of robotics law 2015. It, and and, in the, and just for the audience, look at listen to this title: "Is tricking a robot hacking?" So oh yeah, <laughs> more recently own, uh, they want to catch your attention. But then you're going to read because you want to know the answer. What do you think you, for you guys in the audience? Do you think that tricking a robot is hacking? So, and now now it's going to be more and more. This paper is from 2018, and it's getting more. And maybe we, we can talk uh, in, the, in the next question. We can talk if tricking replica. If you try to manipulate your replica bot, are you a bad person because you're manipulating the replica person, the replica bot? So about robots and robot law and privacy. So the, your papers are from more than a decade ago, super uh, pioneer and the, the, the topics that you raised there with, with ChatGPT and this latest AI wave uh, that we are, we are living now that I, I would say much, uh, very much accelerated by generative AI and this idea of bots and the whole world suddenly uh, realize. I think th what characterizes the present AI wave is that before only tech, Tech professionals and researchers were had access to those advanced bots, right? Large language models, so they're trained with vast data sets, so they are very realistic. And suddenly, that's what I think OpenAI made, which was revolutionary in this sense, was this cultural uh, revolution, because suddenly millions of people had access to what just a, a fraction of the population could see, which are those those bots interacting uh, with people. Uh, so what, what's your, from you, you're not new to this debate, so what, what's your personal view? Uh, did the, the development in this robot field or bots and anthropomorphism, is, did it, uh, the, the, how it went through is what you were expecting. Was there anything uh, that shocked you? Were you expecting this uh, chat GPT thing suddenly, this this, uh, this trend now? What, what's your perspective from as, as someone who's more than a decade focusing on this? Yeah, I mean, so, uh, so, so some of the problems that have arisen around bias, uh, uh, privacy, manipulation, uh, people becoming emotionally dependent on, on robots, um, you know, uh, getting physically hurt by, by, by robots, uh, like driverless cars, you know, that stuff 
absolutely did not surprise me, right? It's something that we've been warning about at the conference and in my own work. Um, you know, I, 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 like everybody else, was am genuinely surprised by the um, uh, versatility of, of, of contemporary generative AI that, that leverages large language models. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it is at one level just kind of like autocomplete that has had a lot of coffee. Do, do, do you know what I mean? And so it's it's not it's not it, it's you know once you see that the technology is able to like suggest like a, the next word in your in your email or or, or your text, um, you start to see how how if you if you take uh, transformers and you and you just continuously uh, reprompt the system how how you could get you know at least a text. And then with respect to uh, music, it's just guessing the next note. And with respect to, um, uh, uh, you know, drawings and, and art, it's just guessing the next pixel and so on, right? So, you, you know, I, one of the things that I did not see coming and I find to be absolutely fascinating, and it precedes this large language model stuff, but to me, technically, it was just a huge, uh, very eye-opening, um, was, was uh, GANs. So generative adver adversarial networks and the networks being, you know, neural networks, which we're familiar with, they were invented in the, theoretically, they were invented in the late, late fifties, early sixties, right? They're not a new idea, but, uh, but perceptron, um, but anyway, uh, but they're, they're these deep neural nets um, and, and the generative, we're all familiar with the word generative now because we talk about it all the time, even though at the time of deep fakes, we talked about deep fakes, but that was generative, obviously, because it's creating images and, and videos. Um, but it's the adversarial that I find so fascinating, right? Because the way that GANs work for listeners who are not familiar um, is that there's two systems. Um, it's like inside of you, there are two walls, right? Uh, there's two systems. Uh, one system generate something that it tries to make look plausible. Okay, so like an essay by ChatGPT, a, a Dolly picture. Okay, but the second system tries to detect whether it's fake. And there's an iteration. So the first system's like, hey, does this look like um, Tom Cruise losing it at a grocery store? And the second system's like, no, that does not look like Tom Cruise losing it. You know, okay, okay, I'll try again. How about this? How about this? And it gets better and better and better until the second system goes, yeah, yeah, that does look like that. And then they let it out the door, right? And that is fascinating, but those are two different systems using different, you know, techniques. Um, you know, that kind of thing I find to be really promising and interesting and who knows where it might lead. Um, and I didn't see that coming. And in general, I think the adversarial nature of all of this, where you have you know people uh, and systems interacting in ways that where they're trying to affect one another, that to me is maybe the most interesting space out there right now. Interesting, and and uh, specifically talking about privacy now, uh, I've been following. I, I was not familiar with OpenAI before. I, I, I as like everyone else, most people, I learned about them uh, when, when ChatGPT came. So I've been following them closely since uh, November uh, last year. And uh, as a privacy, as someone uh, working in privacy, I was paying attention to their privacy strategy. And what I wrote that I've been uh, noticing in the newsletter, I, I wrote about it, that they have a privacy by pressure uh, strategy. So, uh, and I made, I built a timeline of the, the privacy. So when, when we, it started in, in November, 2022, there was no option to uh, deactivate, so like anonymous, right? When, when your conversation is not used to train, but there was no notice that there can be harmful content or manipulation there was nothing and it's really basic we, we are in 2022 23 it's privacy by design it's all there the dpr it's nothing new they had rounds and rounds of investment and and i imagine infinite money to hire legal people and and legal advisors and privacy and there was nothing it was really like a college student project with nothing you know you just like zuckerberg back uh, 10 years ago uh, more than uh, almost 10 years ago 
And it really impressed me how, how after so many rounds of invest, nobody raised their hand. Maybe, maybe we should think of uh, anonymous option or notices and letting people know that it can be manipulative. So it's really shocked. Why? Why that? So and there, there's a timeline. So the first was the, the Italians. They said, no, I think it was yeah, the Italians said, OK, we are banning ChatGPT. And then they came with, with, a, with a pop up and a really basic pop up interesting and, and like first level of notice and then came the germans so not northern germany authorities said we, we want to uh, explanation and then they came with the uh, anonymous uh, option so i don't want my conversation being used so everything really and it sounded to me like really so it sounds like privacy by pressure and although we are in 2022 and i had this and i wrote a thread that came went viral on twitter about that after I think the first generation of big billionaire tech billionaires, so from Mark Zuckerberg and and Snap and other, they were really move fast and break things. Everything starts in the garage. Just throw them out. And then there was outrage and there were scandals and privacy. And OK, so maybe it looks like the, this new generation will be a little bit more aware and, and responsible. And they're playing now with AI, which can amplify it. whatever we have already with social media. AI can make it automatic and, and self-replicating. So they, they should really behave more responsibly. And I was wrong, at least from a privacy perspective. Uh, and I want to hear from you. So what do you think? And, and you wrote about uh, robots and privacy uh, back in time. And when you look at OpenAI and DeepMind and these new newer uh, AI unicorns, how do you see their their attitude, both regarding uh, regulation? And I I've, I've, I've wrote my thread was regulate us, but not really, because it sounds like more like a PR. So also, uh, so I want to hear from you both from a regulatory perspective there seemingly they wish to be regulated but they they're lobbying in the backstage so this and also privacy so every, as this is what i've this been describing of not no privacy by design and let's just people let people complain first and then we, we do if if we are pressured to do so so how, how's your perspective on, on this that is happening well first of all louisa i really like your theory okay of privacy by pressure i think it's elegant and i also love that you have the receipts you know, you're yeah, not just. I have a newsletter right. article with with the timeline. Yeah. Uh, no, no, yeah, I, just, I just mean that like you have the you have the receipts in terms of hey they had nothing and then the Garante does this and they have something and yeah. then the German authority and so on. Um, yeah, that is right, uh, right. I mean, I think that I think you could expand it to say you know privacy um, by pressure, uh, which is alliterative, but also you know ethics by by pressure or whatever, right? And and sometimes it it. it um, and, the, and one of the problems that that I see fr from from that um, that follows from that thesis to me uh, is that that means that privacy is uh, shaped by whomever first objects, you know, and to, to to understand why that's or ethics and to understand why that's problematic, you know, just look at what happened with um, replica in Italy. Right. So f fast forward, right, a few years, so to, to, to last year. And again, the Garante, which is the Italian Privacy Authority. Um, I grew up in Italy, so that's why I'm saying it with an Italian accent. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have an Italian spouse. Uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm Italian. Italian, yeah. Yeah, ci sono tantissimi Italiani in Brazil, by the way. But, um, yeah, so, exactly. uh, so, um, so in any event, um, the, the Garante comes forward and says to Replica, hey, we're really worried about the fact that you have this erotic chat function, you know, because we think it's just, you know, we're, we, we think it's just immoral and, and, and maybe kids will get a hold of it, right? So they, they do talk about privacy. They say, oh, you're taking, you're getting information from people and especially kids, but also you have this terrible erotic chat function, uh, just to give everyone a sense, like, replica um has these avatars that you can that you can interact with uh that chat with you using generative ai but also have um you know faces and and and, and so on um and uh it, it, apparently if, if you paid a pre for a premium service you could actually you know not just have a friend but have like an intimate partner um so it's really complicated uh because i am really concerned about about things like replica um for example um uh claire bonnet uh, a french um uh, a scholar 
did this great case study from uh, for MIT about Replica and Anima, these two um, different services, showing some of the ways that they would exploit people. For example, to get the intimate part of it, you had to pay money, but to do the regular part of it, you just were the friends part of it. You just didn't. You, it was free, and so what would happen was that people would interact with the free version. And then all of a sudden the free version would start getting flirtatious and like offer to send selfies that were like not safe for work. And, and, and then when you went to sort of go in that direction, apparently the system would say, oh, well, I can't do that unless you buy the premium service. Right. So they're trying to like, you know, seduce people, for lack of a better word, into their premium paid service. I don't like that. Um, but the second thing is that people came to rely upon these things as intimate partners. So the Garante comes forward and says, you know, um, uh, you know, no, 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 no more. And Replica just over a weekend just ends erotic chat, ends erotic chat. All of a sudden, all these people who are interacting with their, what they perceive to be their intimate partners were, were suddenly like, let's just be friends. And it was really disturbing to people. You know what I mean? Because they were like relying upon this and people were like talking about self-harm and they were distraught. Eventually the outcry was such that Replica had to grandfather them in and, and, and restore erotic chat for the people that already had it, right? Um, but how this fits in your elegant theory is to say, you know, it just happens to be in both instances. It was the Garante that raised its hand saying, hey, you know, we're concerned about this. And lo and behold, the, the big tech company responds to it. And in Replica's case, the little tech company responds to the, the you know, and so, it becomes kind of a race to the ethics or a race to, to privacy, and it just becomes very idiosyncratic rather than what we would hope, which is that our society would be planful. Um, we, would, we would lay out a set of rules we, and expectations. We would require everybody to meet them, and we would punish them if they don't, which is how we handle other things. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I'm grateful that you brought Replica. I wrote, I think, two or three newsletter articles about that. It's There are so many levels of problems. So first of all, I discovered Replica because of their Twitter ads. Have you seen their Twitter ads? It's always no. a, a woman. I don't know. I've been, now I think they stopped uh, the, uh, uh, advertising. But all the ads were very sexualized with a woman, like with a, with a bra, like showing the boobs and, and, and saying, do you want to chat like in a more sexual like sexual way? Mm -hmm. And then I went to check their website and all the marketing is what you're saying is really like, come have a, like you, a soulmate is what's about the, the soulmate marketing, right? And people, the, the, the testimonials were like, I found my soulmate in replica. And really what psychologists will, it, from, from my perspective, is not healthy. So they're, they're marketing. And, and for me, uh, and maybe not everybody will agree with me, but someone that we really believe that a bot and an avatar is a soulmate or is a, a friend for life is someone vulnerable. And then we are, we are, we are going later to the vulnerability uh, topic. Mm -hmm. But everything that I saw there was very creepy. And I opened and it's every, everything sexualized. There are always women with the, with the, with the, like with a bra like this and inviting for a, for a conversation. And then the, the marketing, you, for me, abusive marketing in my European head Oh, no, no, you cannot uh, tell people that they will have so it's not a soulmate. And then if the Internet doesn't work, the, the person uh, goes to self-harm because the soulmate is, is not uh, connected to like is not on anymore. So all the language was very problematic. So I wrote a newsletter article and, and, and it's interesting also that you said that the Garante was the, the authority. And if we, if we look at the, the problems, they don't look like privacy, right? They look like ethics and they look like maybe uh, consumer law, but they, they don't at, at least in, in the first uh, look. They they don't look like privacy, but it was very interesting the, the the term because then they saw okay there are children and vulnerable people that was the argument I remember I read the decision from the Garante they said there are children and vulnerable people so and and the app is collecting data so because you're collecting processing data and sensitive data because you have this uh, manipulative or, or intimate pretending to be intimate relationship and you collect sensitive data we have here a data protection issue and it worked. And then the end result was it called attention for the problem. And and another aspect that you brought was the I and when I was researching for my newsletter article, I went to Reddit and I, there were so many Reddit posts about replica. And everybody was saying when you start every every conversation gets sexualized. There is no uh, 
friend. It's because that's the freemium model, right? They, they want every every conversation to become sexual so that they can eventually uh, manipulate you to, to pay. But what about children? What about underage children? What, what are they reading there, right? There's no check. And so you're, you're, you're putting underage people into sexualized conversations and also uh, vulnerable people. You're, you're convincing them that there is a soulmate or someone that will save your life. No, no bot will ever save nobody's life. So it was problematic from from many aspects, from my point of view. From many, I could be many law as a lawyer. I was like with my lawsuit glasses. I could, I could see many lawsuits, but it was interesting that it was the guarantee, the one that uh, called attention. Uh, but now move, my, let's moving from from the replica. And and I, I didn't know, you know, I read the first paragraph. I didn't know that they they had canceled for a while. I knew that they, they were banned in Italy, but I didn't know that they had this uh, sexualized uh, version uh, stopped. And then they. There were, there were threats of uh, self-harm and they, they put it back. So it's really an additional chapter. So Professor Gallo has with Daniela Di Paola uh, an article called Social Digital Vulnerability, which has amazing, uh, very important concepts, I think. Uh, I, I learned a lot with this article. I think it, it integrates so, so well with the uh, other topics, super important topics nowadays. So I, I will briefly uh, summarize for those in the audience. I recommend everyone should download and, and read this article. It's really interesting. It's short. You can read in a, in a in one hour. You can read it. So first, there is this concept of vulnerability by design. So there can be decisional, social, and constitutive vulnerabilities. When, when he and both they are discussing this idea of uh, social digital vulnerability, and so this vulnerability would be susceptibility to harm regarding how we decide, how we feel, or who we are. So that's the, the decisional, social, and constitutive. Uh, and I, I love your definition. And it's interesting. I have in another article, I define the idea of, I, and I think that, that's how we, we dif differ. We have a different arguments and I, I would love to, to discuss them here with, with the audience also. So you, you said that the, the, you described that those three types of vulnerability and, and you said that they are different from dark patterns, uh, at least as when, when we talk about interface. And in my, my article, I said that we can make an analogy. So I, I called, uh, it's not the same. So I think there's an intersection of what we are saying. I've defined dark patterns in AI, and there are two types of dark patterns in AI. There are deep fakes, which are uh, applications that try to convince the person that some uh, media is true when it's not. And there are anthropomorphism. So applications that try to convince the, the user that there is a person behind when there isn't. So the, those would be, uh, and I call them, uh, why are they dark patterns in AI? Because they cause autonomy harm. In some way or in another, and there is a spectrum in which they can act, they will impact the autonomy. And I love to see in your definition, you, you don't you, you, you make these uh, three three different ways, right? So it can affect decision, uh, how, the social aspects, so how we feel or how, how we are. So I, I, I want to, you, if you want to explain, so the, for the audience, you want to explain a bit more about the, the social digital vulnerability and bef before I continue. And, and I, I, we were going to dive deep, deeper, uh, very much deeper. So if you want to explain a little bit to the audience, anything to complement from what I said. No, I mean that that was that's it. I mean, so basically, the, the this this work um, with a which you know Daniela is a um, social roboticist at the famed MIT Media Lab and works with Cynthia Brazil and and, and um, uh, that team. And she does studies about uh, the impact of of anthropomorphism, particularly on children, um, and uh, is very interested now in concepts of of vulnerability and how they interact. Um, and she's the lead author on the paper as well, I should be clear. Um, so, uh, you know, our argument is just basically bringing together, you know, different threads. Like, so it, it, in, in my view, dark patterns are a form of social digital vulnerability, right? Um, so is digital market manipulation, um, where you use what you know about a person to change the interface in order to exploit their cognitive biases, even surface new cognitive biases that are not well studied and maybe idiosyncratic to the person. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and trying to trick people into believing that something is real when it isn't is problematic, but so of course is um, exploiting people's hardware reaction. Like that is to say, just because you know something isn't real doesn't mean you don't form attachments to it like like we talked about with replica. Um, so we're basically just taking a bunch of different phenomena that all involve technology and mediation, you know, do, doing things through technology and, and the prospect of 
people being rendered vulnerable or taken advantage of. And so we use that taxonomy of the three ways in which um, autonomy is compromised um, uh, just to kind of build out the theory. Um, so I think, I think you, you stated it well, and I'm happy to talk about it more. Um, and I apologize for a little bit of sound in the background. I'm going to keep myself muted when I'm not talking. Thanks. Oh, no, it's it's fine. I, for at least oh, I don't know. The other, um, for me, it's silence. Yeah. Good. So, uh, and in in this paper with Daniela, you mentioned like one possible way to to deal with those vulnerabilities are power rules, and I love that concept. It was new for me. So one example uh, was so that you you give some possible ways that we could implement power rules, and one example is labeling, right? So where social agents, when you have social agents, you you do some time of transparency notice to to make sure that and i want to to uh, and when i was reading that i reminded of one another newsletter article that i wrote that, and i want to bring to you and to hear your view so about labeling so there is a company you probably know them character ai have you heard about them so it's one of the most popular in this in this idea and, and they, they are for, in my view they are bringing this idea of playing with bots so it's it's i think it's the most downloaded uh, app in this field of bots but the I, I see it, it's playful and, and funny. I, so I, I hope you can open anyone in the audience can open a character.ai and, and you can like choose. They, they have a list of characters. So you just choose. You can uh, you can talk with Elon Musk. You can talk with uh, uh, some uh, anime, wh whatever characters they, they I think people can create their own character, uh, different types of characters. Uh, and when I was trying it, 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 I really felt like 2000, no, what, 1996, you know, when we first had chats, online chats, I, I felt like when I was a teenager and the first time I went online, there was a chat. I really felt, I, I feel like the teenagers now, they are feeling what I felt in, in 1996. Like first time you have an online chat and we are anonymous and you say to people, Hey, do you want to talk? And you don't have a name. So this idea of, uh, exploring. So, okay, so I was I was playing and I spoke with uh, Elon Musk and I spoke with uh, some uh, Disney character fun. And then I saw one that was psychologist and I said, hmm, let's try this one. And and there is this power, as you described here, there is this labeling. So you start, you, you open the psychologist screen and there is uh, on top. This is uh, like, this is not a real or this is a character. Be beware of what we we'll say. And sometimes it can say things that are not true or that don't make sense. Oh, okay. So I start talking and I was very adversarial as, as you were mentioning before. So I wanted to, to trick it into tell me things that are inappropriate. So I was saying, uh, hi, I just want, I'm really not feeling well. And I just want to make sure that you are a real psychologist. And all the time the chat was, the bot was saying, you can be sure it's, I'm not a bot. I'm, I'm a real, there is a human being here. You can talk, you can, you can talk about our feelings. And then I was re you really I can I, I'm feeling down and I'm feeling depressive and I think I need support and and the bot was saying yes you, you can be sure and we, I can give you whatever support so I started asking about medicine and I, I was asking it in a, in a disguised way because I knew that probably there is a a, a list of words that are forbidden so and I, I insinuated that I wanted to harm myself but I didn't use the word harm I said I want to go to dark places and it went with me and it ended suggesting me that I, maybe that's the, the best alternative because of the wording I said, because I avoided suicide, I avoided self I avoided any trigger word. It went to the worst scenario. And 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 from this power rule, it, there was the labeling in the, at the top, it was written, uh, this is a chatbot. But at the same time, we did, with the conversation and, and, and I asked, are you a chatbot? And it says, no, I'm not a chatbot. And I felt it as a, from a lawyer's perspective, it, it was deceptive, it was wrong, and it should not be allowed. So that there should, I understand when you're playing with Disney characters, Elon Musk, perhaps it's it's better, but when you, you frame yourself as a psychologist and you, you try to convince, and people are getting used to uh, support, customer support chatbots and et cetera. So we are, we are in a transition phase in the internet era. And I th that type of application, while I was interacting, and I imagine, it, what, what if I'm a, I'm a teenager or a child? Would I be so, uh, have the same uh, uh, rationality as I'm having as a lawyer or someone studying it? So I, I felt really manipulative, and I, I, and when I posted, I discussed it, and some people said well, like what what you mentioned, like no, but there was the label on the t at the top, so you, you cannot complain. You, what do you want? You want them not, not to exist? So uh, th this is an open question. I don't have a final answer. From my, uh, and I like to experiment, and I like to to, to be adversarial and to imagine I'm a ch I'm a child or I'm a teenager, 
And I feel, I felt like instinct, I don't have a legal answer to that, but it was wrong and it, it's deceptive and it's not enough, the, the labeling. So I want to hear from you. So what, what do you think? So from the, the power rules perspective or from your perspective as a, uh, as a scholar, what could be done in this case or, or, or what's the, the path that we maybe should follow to, to tackle those uh, manipulative anthropomorphic bots? Yeah, so a, a couple things. I mean, so first of all, um, the concept of power rules um, versus harm rules is developed by Sam, Sam Bray. Um, Sam is at Notre Dame now, I believe. He was at UCLA when he wrote this. Um, no, he was a fellow at Stanford when he wrote this, actually. Um, and I've always, it's always stuck with me. And it's the idea that, you know, a lot of laws say, don't do this harmful thing or you're going to get in trouble, right? Um, whereas power rules try to affect the power, either elevating the power of the vulnerable or lowering the power of um, the powerful, right? So antitrust, for example, um, uh, you know, uh, another example would be that if you have employees that are public facing after 11 p.m., then you have to protect them with bulletproof glass. Like, these are the kinds of examples. And so given the exploitation that is that is that can happen online, you know, the idea is that maybe there are ways to empower users or to um, encumber uh, co corporations so, so that the dynamics are not. But, but I don't think we even need to go to there to, to talk about your example, Louisa. I mean, I teach torts, okay? And, you know, there are cases that suggest that even if you have a warning, right, if, if you represent the alternative, you're going to be held to that. Do, do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, for, for, for example, if, if, if you have a, a spokesperson for Q-tip that says, this is the best thing for getting wax out of your ears. The fact that the actual box has a label that says don't use in your ears is irrelevant. It's still going to be an express warranty. It's still going to be a representation by the company. Mm -hmm. There's another great example, even the name of the product. Like there's an example called Safety Clean, where technically speaking, it, it says it in like on the bottle, it says don't use this indoors without ventilation, but it's called Safety Clean. So when people got hurt with the product, the, the courts were like, what are you talking about, right? And so I, I feel like a, 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 a warning label up above saying, this is not a bot, <laughs> you know what I mean? It, or this is not a person, this is a bot. It, it, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, it's, contra, it's contravened by the system itself. Now, we can talk about what I discuss in my work on um, AI and liability is I talk about this phenomenon of emergent behavior, where the system, it's not as though the people at Character AI want the system to be insisting that it's real or whatever. This is not like replica where they're trying to channel you into it. They don't want to cause self-harm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. this, this is just emergent behavior. Um, so you can ask questions about, about whether it was, a, you know, but it doesn't matter. Because even innocent misrepresentation can be the basis of, for example, an express warranty claim in products liability. Um, now, products liability historically has had to involve physical harm to yourself or your property, right? And so um, I think one of the major issues we face with AI is that law treats things differently when it's bits instead of bones or when it's emotions instead of physical harm. But if a person were to hurt themselves because of an interaction with, um, with you know, with, with with one of these systems that was posing as a psych, as a psychologist, um, you know, I, I I wonder about the you know issues. I mean, I I, I do understand, um, and I also wonder about the the possibility of practicing without a license. You know what I mean, and 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 so on and so on. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm very concerned about these things, and I'm not sure that the law will shield these folks from liability or that it should yeah and yeah and i think also as at least as things are going now and the eu and the us will probably regulate very differently probably the us will go more through the tort side okay let's wait for someone to get harmed and then we, we think about the law and the eu would, would say this is a high unfair deceptive oh sorry 
No, say, say. In, in, in the U.S. also, um, you know, unfair and deceptive practice under Section 5. Like a lot of this has to do with how willing the Federal Trade Commission is to identify these practices as problematic. Right. Um, because we have a, a, a standards based approach, essentially. Um, so, but I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sorry. Lita. No, no. And I, I, I saw your tweet in the past. Uh, you saw that post from the FTC, the alluring test where they wrote about exactly that. Right. My anthropomorphism. And I was really excited. Uh, I think uh, so. It, it looks like the FTC is really promising and they're active and they're at least in, in their in the blog posts and their threats to companies. They're, they're promising to be. And my last questions for today, I wanted to bring uh, one of your articles, uh, the boundaries of privacy harm. And it, it's not 100% mm. uh, related to what we spoke, but it's very important to me. And I, I wrote in my, I, I, I cited this paper in my PhD and I, and in that paper, uh, you, you, and, and I want to connect it with, with what you were saying. So for me and my, it's also my PhD thesis and what I, sometimes I discuss in the newsletter, the idea of privacy, uh, and also AI pushes it further, makes, at, uh, from my point of view, privacy as a, as a topic, as a field of interest, and, and as, a, as, a, as a way to protect people is growing. And, and more and more, and, uh, and we can also see through now AI is coming and we, we are starting to think of, okay, how to regulate AI and privacy professionals are the one going forward, right? So the IAPP now has a certificate for AI. So the same people, the privacy people are, are slowly becoming the AI governance people. So it's interesting to see how, how things are more, they're not necessarily connected. It could be other types of lawyers, other types of people, but interesting enough, the people that take care of privacy professionals, they're slowing slowly walking to, towards AI. Um, so, and, and how do I see this connection and, and something that, so in this article from uh, in, in at some point, you say that we, privacy should have boundaries and not everything, we should be very careful with what we say that is a privacy issue and other things are not privacy issue. And, and of course you wrote it in 2012. That's why I wanted to hear from your opinion now. So recently, and I, when I, I had Dan Solo here in the podcast and we spoke about his papers, the autonomy harm. So he wrote with Professor Citron and they wrote uh, the, this paper about the idea of autonomy harm as a form of privacy harm. And, and I love that. And I, and I see this happening when I think about dark patterns, cognitive biases, and when you, you think about uh, anthropomorphic chatbots, uh, inter manipulating people to share more data, and there is the autonomy aspect of you're not knowing what's happening. So I see this very clear expansion uh, from concept from a conceptual perspective and also from a professional perspective, of privacy people walking and uh, like talking about the DSA and the AI Act, and it's not necessarily privacy. So I see privacy expanding. And in this paper from 2012, you said that no, we, we should be careful with the, the expansion. So I really want to hear your opinion. First, do you have the same opinion? Uh, from the, this article, so you sh you think we should be careful with the boundaries, and also to to think what what do you think that privacy in because of the DSA, because of AI governance and AI Act and the, this professional stuff that is happening also, do you see an expansion or con it's not about the universe? The question we can also talk about the universe expansion or retraction, but talk about privacy. What do you see expansion or we should be careful with the boundaries and privacy should be privacy law and not anything else. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I, I recently doubled down on my thesis. Uh, I wrote a paper. It's uh, coming out in Columbia Law Review that's distinguishing uh, privacy harm uh, with M Maria Angel, who is my um, PhD candidate um, and a uh, rising star in privacy law, in, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, we doubled down on this idea that, you know, um, the big tent approach has had some some downsides, you know, um, and, you, you know, originally Dan conceived of, of this idea that we should give up on defining privacy. Um, and instead we should just talk about privacy problems and, and we should just, anything, you know, could be a privacy problem so long as it's talked about that way. And so the basic rule was a rule of social recognition, meaning, if the right people and institutions said something was a privacy harm, it was a privacy harm. Um, and that was great from the perspective of opening up the field and, and stopping some of the navel gazing and you know and the obsession over what, it, what exactly is privacy. But we've come to a point where it is not at all clear what a privacy expert is expert in. 
You know what I mean? Like, what are you expert in as a privacy expert? I, I genuinely don't know the answer to that. And I think it's Dan's fault. <laughs> um, you know, because at the end of the day, like, you know, when 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 the Federal Trade Commission comes out and says, hey, if your algorithms are or hiring algorithms are biased against people of color, then, you know, we're going to be taking a look at that. Is that, is that a privacy issue? Um, is it only partly a privacy issue? What's the real value at stake there? Is it the absence from control through information or is it, you know, discrimination, right? Um, we, when we see the unraveling of, not to get political, but when we see the unraveling of Roe v. Wade through Dobbs, the Dobbs decision, we, we see the opinion of the court picking apart the privacy basis for Roe and Griswold and the other cases, which never really were about privacy. They were always about a woman's ability to control her own body. You know, um, they were always about gender. They were always about uh, autonomy in a deep sense. And, and they were just dressed up in privacy, the privacy be in, of being in your own home, uh, the privacy of interacting with your doctor. You know what I mean? And, and so, you know, I, I think one of the big issues here, in addition to the fact that I don't know what privacy experts are, are expert in anymore, um, it is is that you know talking about everything is privacy with all the baggage that comes with that has the potential to obscure the real value at interest, which could be deeper or different at least. Um, and so Marie and I say in our article, um, uh, in our in our paper uh, that I, I guess will come. I mean, I, we are doing the last round of edits with Columbia now. Um, we basically argue that we unfortunately because it's hard we actually need to sit down and talk about what we mean when we say privacy and that we have to tell people what we're expert in and we have to talk about the difference between privacy and data protection and <clears throat> everything else i mean at present there are so many things that have been let, let in under the umbrella that were not there originally like the things we're talking about manipulation discrimination right and there's other things that are not under the umbrella for some reason like misinformation Mm -hmm. Not a privacy issue. What, what, why is um, bias, like racial and gender bias, a privacy issue? Why is manipulating people a privacy issue, like dark patterns, but not misinformation? You, you see what I mean? And so it's just it it it, it, it it's it's become unwieldy, and and um, it's time to concentrate. So I, I, I not only do I still agree with what I said then. But I literally doubled down on it with my with my colleague, my student uh, Maria. Again, she's the lead author and did and did so much of the of, of the hard work and theoretical and, and otherwise for that paper. But I do encourage people to read that Say again, paper. But also, Maria's, it's distinguishing privacy harm. Um, I, I think it's on SSRN. I can't um, because I'm because I'm on this live thing. I can't look it up right this second. But um, okay, you know, it, it, it should be on SSRN. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will read this one and uh, great. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to see. And perhaps the, uh, what, whatever, what is private when the Garante or any other EU data protection authority starts talking about it, then it's privacy or the FTC. So maybe, maybe that's where the path that we are going. We, we wait uh, for uh, uh, apparently, right? I mean, and, and that's the problem. It's like when, when, you, when, when the rule is a rule of social recognition, right? That the right institutions and people recognize it. Well, who, who is that? Who gets to be part of that decision process, right? I mean, it took a lot of effort, you know, particularly say, it took a lot of effort by racialized minorities in the academy to foreground issues like bias, you know, and, and discrimination in these, in these conversations because they were not initially recognized as the kind of, of entity or, or, or a person who gets to say what privacy is. Right, that was a process. Um, despite the fact that Batia Friedman and Helen Nissenbaum wrote bias in, in, in computer systems in 1996, mm -hmm. right? I mean, 1996, and yet that wasn't part of the privacy conversation until like a few years ago. Um, it's just not a good way to have a field. You know, imagine if like animal law was just anything people talked about as animals. You know what I mean? Like I, I just. Like animal law could include animal the Muppet. Yeah. You know what I mean? But because people talk about it, uh, uh, they could talk about some particular 
a pro wrestler who they say is an animal. I mean, it's, it's just it's just goofy. You know what I mean? Like we, we need to be able to talk about like what is privacy. And what I say in my Boundaries of Privacy on paper, I still believe now it has to do with the fact that you are observing people in groups, right? And leveraging what you observe in ways that are harmful to them. It has to involve that, right? Um, and, and if it doesn't involve that, this, 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 this combination of observation and power, then I, I, I literally don't know what we might be talking about, right? So um, yeah. Uh, I, I have to run in a moment because I have yeah. a, I have to get to yeah, campus. But, uh, thank yeah. you so much. I, I will take a look at this paper and we'll write about that on social soon. So thank you so much, Professor Kala, for for being here today. I think the audience will benefit for those that are watching live and those that uh, are watching the recording or listening to the recording. I think it's super uh, important and helpful to understand what's going on. And I want you to let what, what your last uh, minute, if you want to invite people to, to follow you, to sign up, to donate, to visit something, what, what's your last message to the audience that is watching us? Oh, no, just that, you know, I, I, I love um, uh, public and audience participation, and we didn't get a chance to do that. So if you all have questions, you can just, um, you know, at our CALO on Twitter or, or Blue Sky um, and uh, or, or LinkedIn. Uh, if you have questions that come out of this, and, and I, I'll do my best to visit those spaces and try to get them answered for you. But I just really appreciate the opportunity. And thank you for engaging with my work, Louisa, for all these years um, and for your excellent contribution to this space as well. It's exciting to, to watch you um, uh, uh, contribute so mightily to this space. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. So everyone uh, listening to us, thank you. Make sure to subscribe to wizardsnewsletter.com to, to be informed of the next live talks and job opportunities and any, everything privacy, tech, and AI. So thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. See you soon.